Hi everybody, it's Undaunted Week here on Tabletop.com and we have a huge prize bundle that you could win. Our lucky winner will receive copies of Undaunted Normandy, North Africa, Reinforcements, Stalingrad and we're even throwing in a signed copy of the Roland Revenge art book. Get your comments in on the YouTube channel and on Tabletop.com for your chance to win. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the channel. I'm joined today by David Thompson, one of the designers behind the Stalingrad game and the Undaunted series as a whole. Uh, so if people are not aware by now, and I'd be surprised if you aren't, uh, this is the fourth in the Undaunted series, uh, which has previously seen people fighting it out across Normandy, North Africa, and then there was a, a reinforcements set as well that expanded the scenarios and added uh, some extra versions of play to it. So it's great to have you here on the channel with us, David. Yeah, thanks for having me so much. I appreciate it. Before we get into Stalingrad then, um, if we take a moment to just have a, a quick chat about uh, yourself and the Undaunted series. So um, how did you get into game design? I really began gaming as a more of a RPG guy, role-playing game guy. Mm -hmm. um, growing up on Typical, like everybody else, Dungeons and Dragons, right? The main, the main uh, product there. And it wasn't until much later that um, I discovered board gaming through a podcast. The mm -hmm. podcast had mixture of content, board games, and RPGs. And I started listening for the RPG content. And um, as they were talking about board games, I was like, "Oh, this is this sounds really interesting." Yeah. And and it, you know, coincidentally, I had been working on a game design without really knowing that the you know, the hobby board game market existed. Um, I had played some stuff like Blood Bowl and, and things like that, but very little. So there was this, this sort of transition point about 10 years ago where I really started getting into the the board game hobby. Mm -hmm. um, and then not long after that, I started trying to design, you know, it wasn't until uh, I moved to the UK, moved outside of Cambridge and um, met up with the Cambridge design and play test group there that uh, I really started you know taking not a, not a job right but a, a sort of second job slash serious hobby uh yeah. as a as a game designer those games they were a variety of styles of games as well both um fantasy and historic based and different sort of mechanics behind them so uh when you decided to take the step into sort of full-time game design um were there any particular areas that you you really focused on or enjoy going back to yeah in, when i first started um designing games not really i was kind of all over the place and if you look at the first couple of games that that i had published they're a little bit different in tone than than more of what i've done recently so i co-designed a game called armageddon with uh, chris marling which is it's a post-apocalyptic themed game but it's a very much a euro you know uh tr more traditional euro yeah. style bidding game and then a, a little card game called orc olympics that i designed with trevor benjamin who i worked mm -hmm. with on, on undaunted etc and so i think both in in like i said tone but also game mechanisms the things i was exploring then i was i guess you could say i was sort of trying to find my designer voice like what i wanted to work on what sure. i was inspired by um in more recent years as my interests in military history have have increased so too has the correlation between that that sort of topic in general mm -hmm. um that's not to say that's that's all i'll work on um you know sniper elite for example is a game that i designed not because of the hi military history because it's it's a based on a video game but yeah. because yeah. it was commissioned right so yeah so I'll, I'll mix it up more now but i think that over the last maybe you know four or five years i've sort of found what really interests me if I'm going to spend my my sort of free game design time on it's it's a topic I want to explore um, and then where I'm most comfortable from a game design perspective too uh, for people who haven't played the undaunted series um, do you want to tell them a, a bit about the the sort of the, the core mechanics because it's it's a board game but it's also deck building mm -hmm. and it, it's very difficult to sort of pull them apart as to which is is sort of the more dominant part of the game as well yeah well you yeah you you hit on the head i mean it is it's essentially a mashup between a deck building game and a skirmish sort of tactical game right and just full disclosure you know one of the very first board games i ever played was a game called a few acres of snow it was designed by martin wallace and it's a 
It's a game about the French and Indian War. And what it does is it uses deck building as an engine for, you know, actions on the board, right? Mm-hmm. And there there haven't been many of those games. Um, you'll, you're starting to see a few more now, but that was one of the earliest inspirations for Undaunted, right? How can we kind of, how can you take deck building and sort of use it as this engine for things like command and control and, and uh, you know, Fog cover and, and concealment and all these sorts yeah, yeah. of like, you know, tactical considerations. And if you are, if you're really into that, uh, if you're really into, you know, simulating sort of a, a little squad or platoon based engagement, and you're familiar with those tactics, you can see it mm-hmm. right through the deck building process. But if you're not, if you're just into deck building and like skirmish games, that 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 sort of that piece of it, that modeling doesn't you don't even have to be aware that it's existing. It's sort of in the background, right? Happening but you know, behind the scenes. So that's that's where like the original inspiration for the design concept came from. Mm-hmm. The actual fusion of the two, the the theme and the me- mechanisms came from a trip where I, I um, was visiting Normandy. Uh, I was on um, Omaha Beach, and that's where my grandfather, uh, his unit, uh, landed. True. And so I just decided, hey, I want to do a game based on my grandfather's unit. And and I had this idea for a way a platoon-level game would work based on deck building like we talked about. And so mm-hmm. that's where the, the fusion of the two came from. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating. It, it works beautifully for both the command and control side and the the fog of war as well because you're never certain what's going to end up in your hand and it can easily be uh casualty out of your hand as well which uh, can be detrimental when it comes to the, the strategy and tactics that you're trying to apply so it's the, the synergy in that style of deck building uh, works beautifully as a, as a control mechanic for uh, skirmish games with each iteration of undaunted uh, you've explored a, a sort of a different theater of the war for a start, but also then have changed it. So North Africa, while mechanically similar, is not just a, a reskin of Normandy straight to uh, the North African coast. They introduced um, vehicles with, with multi-seat positions in them and, and how they worked. And it did drop the, uh, I suppose, the, the scale down a step from being platoons to being individuals within a platoon. Is it important for you when you're you're revisiting the series that they're not just straight iterations of the same thing? Everything has to expand or, or be um, a standalone and worthy of being a game in and of itself? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the answer to your question is yes. It's very important, and it's important for two reasons. Um, personally, it's important because, as I said, Trevor and I don't design games full time. It's mm-hmm. it's a you know somewhere between a second job and a hobby. And we have very limited amounts of time we can spend on it. And so if we're going to spend our limited time, we want to be engaged in something we're enjoying. And reskinning something is not to be enjoyable. Yeah. You know, you, you want to have something to to explore and be cre- feel creative with. Um, so if we're going to revisit Undaunted, each title, for our own sake, each title needs to be interesting and engaging. We're going to spend you know, countless hours testing scenarios, you know, you know, 50, 100 times. Mm -hmm. So we better be engaged and interested in it. Um, So that's the personal side. I think also um, when you're dealing with expansions or these sort of standalone sequels, right? So, you know, like you said, Undaunted North Africa stands alone. It's its own thing. Reinforcements is an expansion. Mm -hmm. But anytime you're doing any of those types of things, this is really interesting um, balancing act you have to walk because Clearly, people are interested in the the series because of their first initial experience, right? Or they heard about it or whatever. But sure. but you know, we we really enjoyed what we did with with North Africa. I said it's a very good scale, um, and then reinforcements expanded. Both of those, Normandy and North Africa, um, Stalingrad is very different because of the the sort of legacy style campaign system it has, and then of course, you know, um, Battle of Britain will be. The most different of all, right? But just to, to aerial combat, but but yeah, it's a huge, hugely important thing to to us, and I think the people that are interested in the games to make sure that each feels fresh and different. Sure. Well, on that note, uh, I suppose we've we've talked around it long enough. But the upcoming Stalingrad game, then, um, you've partially mentioned it there that it's a legacy game, but it's not one hundred percent legacy. The campaign itself. 
and how you play it with your opponent is a legacy but then when you're finished you can reset everything back in the box and play a campaign and have a, a totally different outcome to it uh, where, where did that come from because i was chatting to um roland and, and robbie and initially they they thought there was going to be a much smaller game uh, and not as as detailed and branching as it became i suppose so was it always going to be some form of campaign game or did it just sort of grow over time the original conversations about doing what would ultimately become undaunted stalingrad happened as early as 2018 before normandy was ever even released wow right so so one great thing about working with with osprey is um there's a lot of sort of forward thinking and vision um, and the company operates like a fine old machine in terms of deadlines and scheduling and stuff. So um, we knew as, as, as far back as 2018, there was a desire to do at the time a legacy game, not a not a resettable campaign, but a, a destructive legacy game. We didn't actually start really working on it until about 2019, early 2020. At the time when Trevor and I did all the design work for it, it was still envisioned to be a destructive legacy game. Right. Okay. So a uh, combination of factors happened. Some of that was our input. Trevor and I, from for, from early on, we, we designed it to be that destructive nature. And we can talk more about what that means in terms of how it affects the gameplay. Sure. But that's, the, that's how we actually approached the design. But we always felt a little bit uncomfortable about that. And one of the reasons is if you ever play Undaunted, hmm. you'll, typically what happens, you'll play a scenario. And at least one, if not both of the players, about midway through the scenario, it's like, oh, I should have approached this differently, right? Like, yeah. I want to replay this scenario. Mm -hmm. um, well, you, I mean, if it's destructive, you just can't do that, right? Sure. Like, obviously, you can't do that. Um, and, and then it was there's all sorts of considerations, you know, environmental considerations, cost considerations, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. So there was all sorts of things. After the design work had been complete, right, right as we were finalizing the design work, the decision was made for a variety of reasons, some of those were cost, et cetera, that we we're going to make it actually resettable campaign. So what that meant, this is my perspective, but I think this is true. I think this is a fair statement. The consumer ultimately is the beneficiary of that decision because what happens is they get a game that was designed with all of the, um, however you want to say, the, the complexity of this rich branching narrative and all the impact of things happening hmm. like a legacy style game would be, but it's completely replayable. And so from like Roland's perspective, for example, with the art, when we originally conceived what like a, an injured soldier might be, it might just be a sticker, right? Hmm. Yeah. Or a, a damaged tile, it might be a sticker. Well, when we decided that had to be resettable, that means that every component had to stand alone, yeah. right? So that means that like, when you look at the tile um, of, of a city location, in a building, if it, if that building can be destroyed or hit multiple times, damaged multiple times, you literally replace the tile and yeah. it's a one for one replacement. So um, it made the component count go up. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, much, noticed, it's a yeah. much physically larger product now. But um, but yeah, absolutely. And, and we can explore this as much as you'd like. But but because of the branching narrative, every single scenario, whatever happens, whether the Soviets win or the Germans win, it creates a at least one, sometimes multiple branches from that. Hmm. And so there's, you know, over the camp course of a campaign, you'll play something like 12 to 15 scenarios. Um, but there's over 35, I think, total scenarios that can be played. So it's possible that you play through an entire campaign and you restart a campaign. And the only scenario that you play that you had played previously was the very first one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah it, it works. Um, it works very interestingly because you get a lot of push and pull as well uh, throughout Stalingrad um, with one loss leading to the opponent's you know, sort of scenario coming next and then potentially a win or another loss there. It could have you refighting across the same territories within Stalingrad multiple times, but every time you arrive, areas have been fortified other areas have been demolished and access is now um, easier for vehicles or for tanks, especially sort of later on in the campaign when they start to push in. Uh, and the the city itself is as much of a, a character as the, the two opposing forces and its character changes uh, and becomes, I suppose, as, as weathered and beaten down as the forces do uh, within yeah. both armies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really interesting. And for people who 
if you're if you're familiar with Undaunted, um, you'll know this. But for those who who might not be, you know, Normandy and North Africa come with these double sided tiles, and you configure the boards, and the tiles are sort of generic and repurposed throughout the scenarios. Mm. The Stalingrad is not like that. Stalingrad is actually based the the tiles are based on an actual real location within Stalingrad. Mm. Um, and you don't ever you reconstruct the tiles based on the scenario where you are in the area, but they're not they they are real. Like they they reflect a real location. So they're not these generic you just slide them around. So if you wanted to, you could open up the box and you could lay all the tiles out. And it's, I think there's something like maybe 70 ish mm -hmm. tiles that you can put together. And then there's another, I don't know, 40 or 50 tiles that are replacements for buildings that have been destroyed. So you could lay out the entire landscape and see, OK, over the course of the campaign, we might sometimes you wouldn't, depending on how the campaign unfolds, see this this area. And this is what we're going to be fighting for sure. for the next you know 15 scenarios. Yeah, it, it works very well because. Um... Like you say that each each street or each level is sort of stripped and colored so you always you're not going to have that streets jumping about but what you do have is a large segment of stalingrad where every scenario takes place within a snapshot and sometimes a loss or a, a victory in a scenario can mean the difference of maybe going one street further south mm -hmm. um, you know it, it's small increments which i suppose gives a claustrophobic feel as well and, and despite how much uh cost and material and, and the people it takes to take a an area or a street in Stalingrad, you're never really making that much progress one way or the other. Yeah, when we decided to make a legacy game and we knew that we wanted the impact to be felt both in terms of the physicality of the location and the uh, impact of the people themselves, right? And we haven't really talked about that, but no. people can die and, you know, be promoted and stuff. Um, I mean, if it was going to be in World War II, the obvious location was going to be Stalingrad. How how else do you simulate a prolonged conflict that has these lasting impacts in a very, very tight, confined space? You know, World War II, that, that Stalingrad's sort of the quintessential location for that. Sure. Well, we may as well get into the, the actual core armies as well, um, since you've neatly brought it up. The the idea behind, I suppose, the mainline troops, your your riflemen, your machine gunners, and your scouts, as time goes on, they can be promoted or as happened to my B platoon, pretty much wiped out to a man that they just ended up almost all exclusively reservists after a very short amount of fighting in Stalingrad. But that core uh, really has that sort of battered feel where some green trips have been brought in or some replacements or, or people have been injured and then you have your your veterans who have sort of stepped up but then the other supplemental soldiers that you would see in, in other undaunted games that come in like the snipers or mortar teams or that sort of thing while they can still be promoted they can be, become veterans essentially when they suffer losses they're not going to be replaced and that I found compared to any of the other Undaunted games I played, or even when we were playing sort of mini campaigns, you always knew you were going to be pretty much up to full strength or you were at full strength for the next scenario. It has a very different feel when you're playing Stalingrad because you've got that loss um, and very little in the way of, of replenishments coming in. Your choices you make and, and the and when you have to pull the pin and go, this is un, un, not only unwinnable for me because scenarios will be unwinnable uh, when you reach certain points anyway. Like you say, sometimes you get halfway through and realize it's gone horribly wrong. But because you are essentially being told by your superior to go and capture that house or to go and take that point, uh, and you're having to make the call, well, we're not going to do it. But if I keep pushing, I could lose resources that just will not be there for the rest of the campaign. And that really hits home with the legacy feel. Um, but it's done so smoothly with the cards and, the, and the, the split decks that means that you can replace it without having to, you know, tear up a card and chuck it away or stick a sticker over the top of it. How much of the the legacy mechanics and planning went into that, just went straight into the, the final version of Undaunted? Or because you're playing with cards and, and having multiple versions of it, did it give you a bit of leeway to go, well, we can do it like this instead and change it slightly? Yeah, there was a there was a really interesting period early on where Trevor and I had to figure out the, the danger of a system like this is what happens if it gets off the rails, right? Mm -hmm. You know, is there a snowball effect, etc. Unlike 
previous scenario, previous undaunted, there's no option to concede in a normal game of undaunted, right? There's, there, it's not presented as an option. Um, you could always just do it. Say, hey, yeah, I'm not going to win. You, you, you know, you, whatever. But, but here, conceding is is an actual tactic, right? That you might want to employ because you want to protect your soldiers. And there is absolutely this sort of meta game that's going on behind the scenes of, well, I'm here to win a campaign. I'm not here to win a scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I'm losing soldiers rapidly, you know, is it, is it really worth it? You know, I, I'm personally, I, I we took a, a prototype of, um, Stalingrad to Gen Con mm-hmm. and I left with that prototype and it's a very, very close approximation to the final game. And when I came back home, I, um, a, a coworker of mine has been playing a lot of undaunted lately and he asked if we could play a campaign. So I very seldom play my own games. Um, I just like my copy of North Africa, I think is unplayed, right? Yeah. So usually it's either I'm demoing it or, or I don't play it or I play with my kids maybe. But um, I was super excited about playing a final, a finalized version of Stalingrad. So I could experience this as we intended people to play it, not as a play testing scenarios or whatever. Um, and I bring that, that all up because when he and I started our campaign within the first maybe five or six scenarios, we had each conceded one scenario because we knew the costs were just too high to, to continue on in that scenario sure. if we wanted a long-term chance at the campaign. Um, and then the other piece is, you know, many people often comment about the personal nature of the individual soldiers and in Undaunted. Even even in the earlier versions, right? Like they have a card, they're all individual art, these feel like people. And so when you have this combination of that that element anyway, that sort of emotional tie to some of the individuals, knowing that if they are removed, if they die, they're they're gone forever, or potentially they can be promoted, you have this this sort of combination of factors happening. You really want individual people to live because you want them to be promoted. You don't want them to die. You have this sort of meta game happening in the background of okay, um, I, I can't risk my snipers now. This scenario is not important enough. I need to keep them for later. Yeah. So you have all that happening. Well, uh, to go back to your original question, you know, Trevor and I had to make sure the game could still function no matter what happened. And so that's the reason that the core elements, the riflemen, the scouts, and the machine gunners, can never actually be removed from the game, right? The worst case scenario is you get a reserve, which is a weakened version, but mm-hmm. the game still functions, right? Um, and the other thing that's maybe not immediately apparent, but is is sort of an organic uh, element of the way that the campaign plays is, usually if you win a scenario, you sustained more losses. That's, yeah. that's by, by, by far the most common thing. Um, so what that means is, you are more likely to have won scenarios, but have taken more reserve units or lost more upgraded units. Mm. And the players, this is never actually visible to the players because we do so much behind the scenes in terms of which scenario you play, et cetera. But because of the way the game, the game tracks the state of every possible thing that's happened before, yeah. we know behind the scenes that, oh, the Germans have now lost three scenarios in a row. That means they're probably not doing well. That means they probably need some some sort of reinforcement. Let's give them a little something to help yeah. them out. So all of that stuff is is happening in the background. And all of that stuff had to be considered as we were designing the individual units to make sure, okay, the game, can, no matter what, what outcome there is, the game continues to function at its, you know, it's most core. Yeah, there, there's core. a bit of uh, hidden rebalancing within yes, the, the actual scenario tree itself. Right, exactly. It's fascinating stuff. And also, I mean, hunker down is an action that's been in all of the Undaunted. I don't think I really bothered using it in any Undaunted until Stalingrad, because when you're looking at your casualties mounting up, and at that point you're thinking, you know what, this can just go back into my uh, supply, uh, and maybe I can stave off a few more injuries long term. Uh, yeah. and. and uh, and that I think reflects how Stalingrad works very neatly. The the fact that there's a mechanic that's that's always been in the game, but it's only when you really play a campaign out that has long term consequences for the makeup of your force do you really see the benefit of that one little tiny action that's that's always been there and you're going, Well, actually, it would be good if we just pull those guys back from the front line, essentially, just send them yeah. a, a bit further back and, and let them stave off 
uh, the uh, hor horrors of war for a little while longer. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's also a ton of consideration about which soldiers you choose to use from which units. Um, mm -hmm. Some of that's based on their upgrade, right? Do I want this new capability that this soldier has? And some of it's using your reserves to protect your other soldiers, right? Yeah. On that note, because I don't know if it's actually, if I missed it in the rules or not, but because you can potentially have um, five riflemen and two could be upgraded, two could be fine, and one could be a reservist. Is it just carte blanche as to who goes into your hand whenever it says that you start with one in your in your deck and then the rest in your supply? Or you, is there you can choose. Uh, yeah. See, I, yeah. I thought you could probably choose, but then I went, but then you'd always choose like the good ones, maybe. Uh, certainly but at the beginning when you don't have as many decks. So we ended up, we because every card is numbered, um, mm -hmm. so for the people at home that, zero one or zero 014 will have a an equivalent as an upgrade and a reservist but they're always the zero 014 number so we just stacked the decks in their sequential order and it meant if you were taking um the you know two riflemen then you were taking the top two and it right. didn't matter whether they were upgrades or not uh, and we thought that it, it's interesting because you know that you've got good cards in there and maybe you're starting off with some regular and maybe a couple of injured and you're thinking well do i just cycle through that deck quickly do do i try and get them all into uh into my deck yeah. as quickly as possible no that's a good that's an interesting approach i think that's that's kind of a cool a cool way to do it giving the players the option to who they want to add provides some really interesting choices for the players right mm -hmm. because in some regards you say well i'm just going to take my best people because they'll help me but in some regards it's back to the same meta meta choices maybe i don't really need my best rifleman for this scenario because of whatever so i'm mm -hmm. actually going to choose to use a reserve rifleman so there's no threat of them being killed, right? Yeah. So there's there's sort of, you know, this balancing act of when is the right time to use your best people. It's interesting. I may may have to go back and revisit our campaign when we finish, but I think we're going to continue playing it as we are at the moment anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there any other standout sort of uh, moments from Stalingrad that you'd like to discuss? So when we originally created Undaunted Normandy, we obviously didn't have the luxury of knowing what people liked and wouldn't like and wanted, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the very first things that people said was they wanted more asymmetry in the game, right? Mm -hmm. And if you ever played Undaunted Normandy, there's tons of asymmetry in the scenario itself. There's tons of asymmetry in the deck, like what's available to you in the supply in your starting deck. Yeah. But if you were to take out the entire deck and look at it, it's the same, right? So we immediately sure. changed that up in North Africa. Um, the way Stalingrad works is there is asymmetry. Even if you were to take all the cards out and look at them, the Soviets are very different than the Germans. But the most radical asymmetry comes in terms of what happens over the course of the campaign, right? Mm. Um, the way it unfolds, certain players may never get many of the cards that are potentially available to them. So I think that the way that the game sort of organically evolves and produces that asymmetry is interesting. The players themselves, based on how they've played and won and lost, like yeah, I told you that I'm in the middle of a campaign myself. Yeah. We've played the first 11 scenarios. I'm playing the Soviets and I am absolutely decimated. I went through, and recently we were playing a scenario where I think I came out of it with almost every single soldier was a reservist. Hmm. Whereas my opponent, um, almost every single card he was playing with was upgraded, right? He was just, it was insane. But I had won most of the scenarios, yeah. right? And so you have this very interesting dynamic of um, the, the, that sort of experience, right? Like yeah. how, how does that feel different? So I think just the, the emergent sort of experience that the players are going to feel every time they play it, if they do, if they do play it, mm -hmm. is, is probably the most standout feature. Now, me personally experiencing it sort of for myself for the first time in its final version, the, the thing I enjoy most is seeing Roland's art and reading Robbie's narrative, right? Yeah. Because I, I didn't have that when I was designing it. Sure. And so for me, it's kind of like visiting this this game that I'm kind of familiar with, but at the same time, seeing it for the first time. Yeah, no, that makes an awful lot of sense. The uh, the, the combination of those two on top of the, the game really gives you a, a fascinating uh, view into both sides of the forces within Stalingrad. I particularly like the... Uh, the NCO, the German NCO, who's been slowly consuming a bar of chocolate over <laughs> weeks slash months. He's been ha harboring and hoarding it to himself, just eating a little tiny sliver every now and again. And yeah. somebody from somebody from high command gets sent down to him and catches a meeting and it's just like, leave me alone. I, I know you've seen it, but I'm not offering you any of my chocolate. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I suppose it humanizes the, the people that are, are 
oh for fighting sure for you, yeah uh, which yeah is for a, sure for sure and, and one thing we should we should mention um to that point is that unlike the the other games where the players share a scenario book and it and it provides you know maybe a paragraph of sort of background information about you know it actually historically inspired scenario but it's it's relatively you know it's mostly setting you know setting yeah. it up um for context in this in this game there's this rich narrative written by Robbie and um each side has their own book and they never share that they never share their narrative and yeah. they never share so there's some secret elements to some of the scenarios that their opponent doesn't know about it's it's fascinating and uh, if people want to find out more about that i'll be sitting down with roland and robbie later on in the week uh, to have a discussion about how they uh fleshed out and uh, built the narrative and world of stalingrad as well uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, David. If anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to pop them below and I will pass them across and see if you can get them answers. Otherwise, stay tuned because we've got plenty of videos coming out for the rest of the week about all of the Undaunted series and, of course, Stalingrad itself. Until next time, bye-bye. Hi, everybody. It's Undaunted Week here on Tabletop.com and we have a huge prize bundle that you could win. Our lucky winner will receive copies of Undaunted Normandy, North Africa, Reinforcements, Stalingrad, and we're even throwing in a signed copy of the Roland Revenge art book. Get your comments in on the YouTube channel and on Tabletop.com for your chance to win. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.